Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this uh, web chat and web workshop today about the leap year and why this is going to be a leap year for the climate justice movement. My name is Katie McKenna, and I'm the engagement lead for This Changes Everything and one of the organizers behind the Leap Manifesto project. We have a bunch of great people joining us today, um, but first I just wanted to tell you how you can participate and ask questions during the event. So you have a Q&A um, button at the top of your screen and you can use that to ask questions and those will appear uh, on the side of the screen. So you can also uh, upvote, vote for other people's questions if you want those ones to rise to the top and make sure that we see those ones first. The other way you can do it is through the hashtag LeapYear, uh, using the hashtag LeapYear on Twitter. So we'll be following there as well and looking for your questions there. So we're really lucky to be hosted today by Avi Lewis, who's the director of the documentary This Changes Everything, and one of the main organizers and initiators behind the Leap Manifesto. So over to you, Av. Thanks, Katie. Um, if anything goes wrong today, we will be appealing to Katie. So this, this may or may not be the last time you see her. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to do this. You'll notice that I'm, I'm the host of this chat because I have a rectangle and everyone else has a square. So I just want to say off the top, this I get the rectangle, okay? Is everyone cool with that? I will introduce you to my chattees, Naomi Klein, coming to you uh, from all the way in the next office here in our home in Toronto. Hi, Naomi. Hi. Bill McKibben. Bill, are you at home in Vermont? I'm actually down at Middlebury College in Vermont. Oh, you're at Middlebury College. Bill McKibben of 350.org. Naomi, I didn't introduce you. You wrote a book called This Changes Everything, various other things. Sorry for the ragged opening, folks. We're very pro-production. Uh, Bianca Mugenyi is one of our colleagues from the This Changes Everything and Leap Manifesto team who's in Montreal. Hi, Bianca. Hi. Um, and uh, we're hoping that Assad Raymond, uh, Friends of the Earth uh, UK, will join us if he, uh, if he gets out of whatever meeting he's in. I just got a note that Assad is joining momentarily. He's, he's got a revolution to foment there, so that only takes an extra minute. And we will have a dispatch later in the hour from our colleague Alex Kelly, who is living in the center of Australia, on what's going on in, uh, in the climate justice movement and landscape in Australia. This is a leap year. Um, leap day later this month uh, is a time when lots of people around uh, North America and around the world will be having meetings and teach-ins and film screenings and marches and rallies and all kinds of other mobilizations. Uh, to send a clear message to the world that this is the year we have to leap in terms of uh, climate and in terms of justice. Uh, and so this conversation is to kind of set that landscape and look ahead uh, to the leap year coming and fire up a little leaping energy um, with any, with any like we won't leap out of these uh, very boxes, uh, but we, were, we, were, we, were, we are leaping into your computers at this moment. I want to start with Naomi. Um, we're going to have a little go-around of some initial spiels, and then we're going to get into a much looser conversation, and then we'll start taking your questions. Um, Naomi, I happen to know from the backstory that this whole leap meme started somewhere in the recesses of your brain. Why is the leap such an appealing metaphor to you? Why did you, why did you settle on this framing, which has been so helpful to so many of us? Um, well, it just came out of wanting a catchy title, and you know, this is actually a title that, that lots of people have used. There are several books called The Leap. Um, the last chapter of This Changes Everything is called The Leap Years. Um, and uh, we had a few really lousy titles for this, the, the Leap Manifesto, before we found The Leap. I believe that the first one was Shock to Shift. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, and I really dislike. I really dislike that one. Really didn't work at all. Um, first, I just want to say something that we haven't said yet, which is that there is this thing called the Leap Manifesto. Um, and it is a document that was drafted with 60 uh, organizers at a meeting uh, last May in Canada. Um, but it is a document that um, ha has had an impact outside of outside of the country. People have taken this document and, uh, and used it as inspiration for, uh, for, uh, for other sets of climate justice demands. We're going to hear about that in Australia and the UK. Uh, it's happened uh, in Europe with a coalition of green parties. Um, the idea was that uh, we in Canada found ourselves in a situation where we thought we had 
a really powerful opportunity to transition very quickly off of fossil fuels for um, for a few reasons. One, you know, rising climate justice movement that was taking on uh, all the tar sands projects, uh, a very strong indigenous rights movement uh, that was doing the same, including in the courts, um, but also that the price of oil had just collapsed when we had our meeting, um, and that investing in the Alberta tar sands suddenly seemed like not such a great deal from a, a market perspective. Um, and so we had this gathering um, because we understood that this economic crisis that our country was experiencing could play out in a couple of ways. Um, one of the ways is it would just turn into a budget crisis that would be passed on in the form of austerity to the public, right? Um, but what we saw was an, was an actually an opportunity to use the fact that the industry was crashing on its own to say, okay, look, we need to get off fossil fuels if we are going to have a chance of, uh, you know, of, of, of a safe future from a climate perspective. Let's do it in a way that brings all of these different constituencies together, that creates huge numbers of wealth paid, unionized jobs. Let's do it in a way that heals the founding wounds um, you know, of our country. Uh, so you know, we brainstormed people from all different sectors, indigenous rights, housing, food, climate, uh, you know, 315 Greenpeace were there, um, you know, labor leaders were there, um, uh, no one is illegal, you know, it's just an incredible coalition of people. And, and we came up with this vision, and then we needed a title for it. <laughs> um, and just tactically, the point of the vision was we knew we were going to have a new government, or at least we hoped so. Um, and you know, having seen what happened after Obama replaced Bush, where there was this sort of um, huge relief, you know, the witch is dead, right? And everybody thought, well, we can relax. We know that we can't do that just because we got rid of Stephen Harper. And... Um, and, and, you know, that's actually the worst thing we could do. We're more than halfway through this critical decade. If we don't get our emissions pointing in the right direction by the end of this decade, you know, we're in a world of trouble. So we need to make the most of the fact that we now have a government that we can have more influence over, and we need to push that government as hard as we can from the outside. So this, what the idea was, okay, we know this government is going to be pushed by industry. Um, we need to be pushing... Uh, the new government, um, you know, in a new sort of outside power configuration. So that's what the Leap Manifesto is. People should read it at leapmanifesto.org. Um, and, uh, and, and the name, uh, you know, the reason why we like the metaphor, Hayasad, um, uh, is that, you know, it has that connotation of speed, right? Um, you know, you, and, and it also, I think, has that connotation of, 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 um, a phrase that I first heard from Leanne Simpson, a wonderful um, uh, indigenous writer here in Canada, an Ashtabe writer, um, of punctuated transformation, that of change on multiple fronts at once. Um, and, you know, addressing uh, racial justice, gender inequality, um, the jobless and inequality crisis, and climate change all at the same time. So that's why we like to leap. And then we realize, wait a minute, 2016, when we are going to be pushing for this thing, is a leap year. And the other thing that we thought was kind of cool timing is leap day, which is at the end of February, you know, having had some experience at UN climate summits in the past, um, you know, I had a pretty good idea um, that people were going to be um, not, you know, within the movement, not that thrilled with what came out of Paris. Um, you know, the run up to these UN summits all, always takes a huge amount out of the, the movement. Um, but it seemed to us that, you know, the end of February gave us a good sort of timing to sort of, um, you know, get over whatever happened in Paris, you know, uh, brush ourselves off, and then talk about what, what we actually need to take the, to, you know, to, to respond to this crisis in a serious way. And then um, the other piece of it that was just sort of nice from a writerly perspective um, is that the reason why we add an extra day to our calendars every four years is because our calendars, this human created system, actually does not correspond with the Earth's revolution around the sun. Um, so we change our calendars because it's actually easier to change human created rules than it is to change the laws of nature. And that's actually something that we we need to understand about our economic system, um, which is colliding with the laws of nature and our political system as well. Um, so we like it as a metaphor, we like the timing, and that's, that's the leap concept. <laughs>
Um, um, let me let me let me move you along. Uh, you're we're just joining us. We're having a conversation about uh, the, the the climate justice landscape in this leap year, building momentum towards uh, Leap Day at the end of the month, where people around the world are are hosting events, and we encourage everyone to 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 start to start leaping whenever in this leap year. Um, I and uh, five people. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, we've only got five people here. So and we and 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 we're positively leaping out of our chairs. Assad Raven has uh, seen fit to join us in the UK. Sorry to wake you, Assad. I know you're a busy guy. Um, but let's as we as we broaden this conversation from where the sort of leap meme started in Canada. Uh, I know that you found it useful in the UK. Can you give us a quick snapshot um, in this initial go round um, as to what's hap how you guys are using the leap um, and what's and 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 what's happening on the cutting edge of uh, of climate justice activism in the UK these days. Thank you, and, and apologies for being late. I had a hospital appointment, and I'm sweaty because oh, I'm... Oh, no, now I feel like crap. Why? Did, you have, did yeah. you have to play that card? I know, it's the only card I could play. There you go. <laughs> well, I think it's a, we're in an interesting moment, of course. Um, I mean, I agree with Naomi that for many of us, at least in terms of the climate justice movement, you know, Paris was not the end destination. It was to get through Paris and look out the other side and how we could build power. And I think there was a, a general recognition that our existing forces were just not sufficiently strong enough, were neither diverse enough and didn't have social support amongst large sections of society to be able to deliver the kind of transformations that we wanted. Now, on one level, the issue of climate justice has moved very central. I mean, President Hollande, even in Paris, said, I'm all for climate justice. So as a term, I think very ma many mainstream NGOs and think tanks and politicians have all taken on the term without actually understanding really what it means and what kind of, um, you know, what's behind that. Now, for us as Friends of the Earth, we've been engaged in a very, very long-term piece of work, which miraculously was exactly when we got drew inspiration of course from the Leap Manifesto but we recognized that actually right across Europe similar things were happening that local activists were recognizing that as much as we were fighting site battles and winning site battles that simply winning individual site battles wasn't going to be sufficient what we actually needed to do was to look at how we build power now when we looked at how you build power you actually had to have a theory of change and a theory of change that recognize that advocacy by itself or simply calling for climate action in itself was not going to be sufficient. So if we wanted to just move beyond focusing on resistance, and, and there are, of course, lots of positives that we can build from the resistance fights, whether it's the divestment work or the individual fights, how do we become more diverse and, and reflect the societies in which we operate? And how do we build and engage with the social forces, and particularly with the trade unions, but also with other social forces such as anti-racist movements, women's organizations, and black and diaspora organizations. And so over the last year, we came together and formed uh, uh, the, court, the title of our march here in the UK was uh, the People's March for Climate, Justice, and Jobs. We wanted to bring those issues very much together. Uh, we saw that as a way to deepen the relationship between the trade union movement, the climate justice movement, but also with diaspora organizations. And of course, last week we had our Climate Rising event where we had over a thousand people in an event organized by Friends of the Earth, This Changes Everything UK, but also PCS, the Public Sector Union. Now, this was important because what it said and it sent out a very, very strong signal was we were not going to reduce ourselves back to being an environment movement or even a climate movement, that what we were determined to be was actually a justice movement. And I think that is actually where we are, and it's quite an interesting moment for the climate justice movement, not just in, in the UK, but I think across Europe. Um, there, there, is, there is definitely a, a, a feeling uh, that Paris was helpful in terms of coalition building, and we're seeing more momentum around that, and many organizations around the world uh, redoubling efforts to, to expand the coalitions that, that they work in. And I know, and Bill, I want to bring you into the conversation because I know that 350 is uh, working in coalition with groups around the world on the on the Break Free from Fossil Fuels campaign, which culminates in May, if I'm right. What's your take on the on the state of the leap year and the work that that you guys are doing? Well, first of all, what fun to get to join in with you all. Um, um, you know, I don't get to live quite in Canada, but I'm very nearby. 
uh, in Vermont. So the, all the good energy leaking down across the border is able to incite us down here too. And so people are, the first thing is, people listening should really take the time to go read the manifesto um, um, because it's well written, it's smart, but it gets at the thing that Naomi started us all really thinking about in a deep way a couple of years ago, um, the, the way that we got to understand the interconnections of things. Now, the world's making it easier for us to understand those interconnections every day. Um, um, it's you know terrifying to open the newspaper the last week and read the stories coming out of South America where we're now telling women, couples, that they shouldn't have children because we've got a, uh, a disease spreading on the back of uh, uh, Aedes aegypti mosquito, uh, the mosquito whose range we've so dramatically expanded as we've warmed the climate. Um, um, every, at every turn, um, these links get clearer and more explicit. And so, do the, um, so does the understanding of just how uh, powerful and screwed up our adversaries in this fight are, you know. The big news, I think, in the last six months, in some ways more than Paris, was the news that came out about what Exxon had known about climate change and, and how they'd lied to the world for a quarter century. So I think people really are ready to leap in all kinds of ways. Uh, all around the world in May, you're right, um, um, there's this break free from fossil fuel thing that many groups are collaborating on and there'll be people uh, out in the streets everywhere, especially at these huge major carbon deposits from Nigeria to Australia to North America to whatever. Um, they'll be doing it against the backdrop of you know, what looks like will be another record-breaking hot year around the world. And they'll be doing it, uh, however, also against the backdrop, uh, as Assad points out, of this really powerful rising all over the planet. Um, that was what was keen about Paris, was the feeling that, uh, in many ways, uh, the movement was more in control of the narrative than anybody else, um, that it had gone from being, you know, uh, uh, politicians who were able to figure out how to manage this system, they couldn't really manage it anymore because now there were too many other people looking on. And the more of those people there are looking on, the, the, the better we're going to be. Um, um, it's exciting. It's powerful. It's also, I, I've got to say, a scary time. Um, um, it's, it's brutally... Um, hot season, and I, you know, I just was watching the pictures of some of the oldest trees in the world burning in Tasmania in an out-of-control forest fire. When one thinks about Tasmania and its history as a kind of epic test case of uh, genocide, um, and now of kind of wiping out um, um, what's left, what was remaining of the kind of natural world, um, it's, it's easy to get scared, but when one gets scared, one needs to get to work. And so many, many thanks to you all for putting us to work. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's keep expanding the frame of reference here. Uh, we have a colleague that we work closely with in Australia, Alex Kelly, and they've been developing uh, some momentum towards a, 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 an Australia adapted leap manifesto there. They're in the early stages of building the coalitions and articulating the vision. But there is tons, as you know, Bill, um, and Naomi, who was there uh, just a few months ago, there's tons of uh, climate af activism going on in Australia. Ale Alex has just uh, moved back to Alice Springs, where she lives in the center of Australia. And we asked her because it's, well, you'll, she'll explain, but we asked her to do a little, a little video dispatch instead. And in our slick show here, if everything works beautifully, Katie's going to play the little YouTube video that Alex put up for us. Look at that. There's Alex. 
Hi everyone, I'm making this video as a pre-record because it's going to be the middle of the night over here in Alice Springs, Central Australia, while you're all on the Google Hangout. Sorry I'm not joining you in person, but I look forward to watching the archive of the conversation afterwards. I'm sure it's going to be a really rich one. Um, as people probably are aware, we've got a lot of challenges over here in Australia, and whilst we might have got rid of the climate denialist Tony Abbott, our new government is still just as in the thrall of the fossil fuel industry as Abbott's government was. You may have also heard that the Queensland government just approved the Carmichael mine, which is the biggest, if it goes ahead, which it won't, the biggest proposed coal mine in the world. But the Wonga and Jungalingu people are leading an incredible resistance to that mine. And across Australia, we're seeing uh, gas fields and coal mines and blockading um, happening, but with really new, interesting alliances being formed between farmers and pastoralists, Indigenous people, and green groups. So it's not all dire, but it is certainly a time for us to come together and talk about the transitions that we need to make. So, really excitingly, in the next few months in Australia, um, Bill Building on Naomi's visit here last August in September, there's a group of us meeting in Sydney in March to have a retreat to look at the model that, of the LEAP manifesto in Canada and see how we might apply that kind of process to Australia. Uh, we've got an election coming up this year as well. We're really interested in how the LEAP impacted on the election process and, and the kind of public narrative in Canada. We took a lot of inspiration from that. In April, there's a big Beyond Coal and Gas gathering and a lot of these communities that I mentioned before are coming together to talk about tactics and campaigns and strategies and ways of building the momentum against the fossil fuel industry here in Australia. And then, of course, in May, we'll also be taking part in the Break Free uh, global mobilisations against fossil fuel infrastructure. So um, there's a lot going on, both good and bad, but we recognise that this is a time for a very rapid and just transition and I look forward to working with all of you in coalition to achieve this. Thanks and have a great chat. Bye. Hi everyone. Oh, just once is perfect. Thank you. Beautiful. That was great. What a slick show. I'm so excited. Um, Alex, uh, Alex talking a little bit about there about what's going on in, in Australia. And um, uh, folks who are watching, you can, uh, you can ask questions, which I can throw to, our, uh, to the folks here on the, on, on the chat. Um, I'm not very versed with the, uh, the, the Hangout software, so let me just tell you what I've figured out. If you hover your mouse over the left side of your screen, this little menu bar comes in. and uh, one of the little icons has a Q&A. If you click on that Q&A, you could type a question into the, into the Q&A, and uh, Katie, working beautifully behind the scenes, will slap it into a place where I can see it, and I'll put it to our folks. And there's also a hashtag um, where you can tweet questions. And Katie, what's the hashtag for tweeting questions? Katie's going to tell us. Do you uh, have uh, leap year. Hashtag leap year. Hashtag leap year. So you can uh, tweet questions at us as well. Bianca, let, let me bring you into this. Um, you have been steering a lot of the Leap Manifesto organizing in Canada, and you, I think you have a handle on a lot of the Leap Year events that are coming up. Just to give people, just to seed some ideas about stuff that people are doing and why people are using the Leap Frame, can you give us a, a brief on what's, what's coming up, some of the things on your radar? Yeah, sure. So, like Alex said, there's a lot going on. Um, we're so pumped about the upcoming official Leap Year campaign, um, which is launching this 29th. And, um, I mean, to very briefly review, um, the Leap was launched on um, September 15th with the support of dozens of cultural and uh, political Canadian figures, from Leonard Cohen to Ellen Page to Donald Sutherland. In November, the Canadian Union of Public Employees held a Canada is Ready for the Leap rally, which was attended by over 1,500 people. And in December, we took the Leap to a global stage uh, during the climate negotiations in Paris. And this Leap year, we're taking it to the next level. Um, but we need you uh, to do that, um, folks who are watching this. And we're inviting partners to host events and discussions across the country in February. Um, so here's how you can get involved. First of, all, first of all, check out our website. It's leapyear2016.org. Um, and on our website, you can find out lots of information about how to host an event. And to give you um, a sense of what's possible, past events have included things like community forums, panel discussions, 
film screenings, art projects, and workshops. Um, we have a event resource guide, which is hot off the press. It's got ideas, discussion questions, tips, and materials that you can use to host a leap year event. Um, it's basically a step-by-step -step guide to getting your event off the ground. Um, you can also join in or attend events that are already happening. Um, we popped a, a map onto our website so you can check to see whether there's anything happening near you. Um, and you can also let other people know what you're working on. So we've got an interactive calendar where you can actually upload and post your own events throughout the year. So for more information or if you want to share your ideas with us, um, you can get in touch with me at contact um, at leapmanifesto.org or anyone else on the Leap Manifesto team. If you've got ideas brewing for things like a video clip or a meme or a poster, please shoot us an email. Um, we're really open and have been taking lots of ideas from lots of different places and groups. Um, so taking part in Leap Day and Leap Year can also simply mean spreading the word in your family, workplace, community uh, about a justice-based justice based transition away from fossil fuels. Um, in terms of our website, we also have downloadable versions of the manifesto in 10 languages, um, which you can use to spread the word. We've got posters as well as social media materials. And of course, don't forget to sign the manifesto if you haven't. There's lots in the works. Check out the cool events that are online. And you can also follow us on Facebook for daily updates. So we're feeling great about officially launching the Leap Year campaign at the end of the month. And let's see if we can make this year one for the history books. This is, see, this is why we needed to bring Bianca in to get a little jolt of that, of, of that un, unbridled uh, uh, positivity. And I, and I do want to check in with all of you, and I just want to break this out of a Q&A kind of thing, and let, let, let's just chat. We're, we're, we're pals. Um, there's no need for us to be stuffy about this. I want to take your collective temperature on this movement moment. You know, These climate summits like Paris uh, have a way of, of sucking up a lot of attention. So do American you, you know, presidential election cycles, um, which is really going to start dominating the news, not just in North America, but it has an impact globally. Uh, Europe has its own set of, of dynamics, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of how you are all feeling about where the global movement is at. Oil is at a historic low, which means that some people, you know, in some places people are using more of it. We're going to get a stream of, you know, oil companies sobbing into their billions of dollars of losses. In Canada, we see in, in the post-Harper era already, the oil companies are positioning themselves to be the victims in this next year, needing help from governments. Um, and people have been fighting really hard on specific battles. Like I know in, in North America, the, the Keystone XL pipeline was a big battle. That battle is over. So what, you know, we're, I, I, are we in a roadrunner moment where the, we, we're, we've run off the edge of the cliff now where the legs are, 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 are moving fast? Are we leaping to the other side, or are we kind of suspended in midair? Anyone can take that up. Whatever. Well, not all know, I think we're in a uh, crazy, uh, our problem almost is that we have such a target-rich environment that it's almost hard to choose what thing to go after next. Um, um, and you can sort of watch it almost unfolding in real time. We're definitely um, on the offensive. Uh, if you mentioned the American presidential election, I remember four years ago when you couldn't get either uh, Barack Obama or Mitt Romney to even mention climate change, much less climate justice. Uh, last night, pushed by uh, you know pushed by the inexorable rise of Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, uh, you know the sort of definition of where the center is in everything, um, um, told uh, some of the. 350 people who were there videotaping uh, candidates in New Hampshire said that uh, time had come to end all fossil fuel extraction on public lands. What? Yeah. Um, um, said that on cam. Said that on camera. Yeah, yeah. So the camera's a little shaky, but it's there. It is. <laughs> um, um, wow. And it, was, it was great work. They've been doing that kind of stuff all along, and that's you know, that's the the kind of uh, uh, recipe for. I mean, it's the same thing starting to happen everywhere. I was just looking at the list of stuff going on in this break three stuff, and it's amazing. I mean, and in tough places, you know, three big actions in Nigeria, big targeting the coal projects in Manila, uh, uh, in Turkey, where they, you know, the government wants to build a lot of coal plants, but if we can hold people 
there and you know everywhere for just a couple more years if we can hold the fossil fuel industry at bay then inexorably we're going to start winning these fights the price of the solar panel keeps dropping with each month that goes by so these guys are fighting back super hard no question i mean Warren Buffett just managed to convince the Nevada Public Service Committee, the uh, Utility Committee, to uh, eventually, you know, to sort of uh, basically outlaw solar panels in Nevada, which is only like the sunniest place on the entire planet, you know. But um, um, but fights on everywhere, and it's happening in the right spirit. I think that the right kind of messages are getting out there that it's not at the bottom a technical problem, that it's at the bottom a kind of problem with the way that we organize stuff and I tell you if you um, you know just because since I'm a Vermonter and we have a lot of Vermont pride to watch uh, our senator Mr. Sanders um, uh, 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 out there it's very clear that no nobody with uh, no politician with a brain is going to take money from the fossil fuel industry or the financial industry with quite the same um, uh, institutions that they have uh, in the past. Um, um, it's really, begin you know, the fact that people are pissed off is really starting to break through even to the political class, which is always the last people to figure everything out. Asad, what's, what, what's your feeling from a European context on this sort of movement moment, the momentum and the challenges? Well, I think the, one of the things we have to avoid is, of course, you know, some of us were here before when we talked about the financial crisis. Was this the moment when not only were we going to fix the economy, but actually have the vision of a better economy? And, of course, we could say that the forces of capital and neoliberalism recaptured all of that space and shoved us actually even further back. So I think the challenge now is really not simply our politicians or even mainstream NGOs of what are they saying about climate change, but actually what is their vision for the alternative? And I think that's really the more interesting space. And so when we talk about system change, what kind of system change are we talking about? Who for? Who are we going to be accountable to? What kind of inequalities are we going to cha challenge? What's the importance of intersectionality and all of these other issues within there? Are we talking about climate or actually are we talking about a bigger fight about injustice? So I think those are real challenges for the climate justice movement. And then that determines actually who you're going to build your alliances with right. and for what purpose and what allies. And, you know, there's a real debate. There's a debate here in the UK with the climate movement, with some people say that we still should go for breadth, that the, the aim is to have as many people as possible saying, take action on climate, where rather than having a deeper analysis of more people saying, what are we for? How do we build common agendas? and draw more social forces. And if we are in this decade of, you know, decade zero, where what we happens now determines whether we keep temperatures below 1.5 or 2 degrees, then I think we have to be able to talk about climate change in a way that engages many, many more people. And I think the big challenge now actually is to the NGO movement and to what I would call the broad stream climate movement, because they've been challenged by justice organizations, by diaspora organizations who are saying, hold on, you framed climate for too long as this very narrow uh, way of talking about climate change that only spoke to really an elite who had power, privilege to be able to determine and shape the demands and the narrative around climate change and even the theory of change. And now that theory of change, those narratives are being challenged and people saying, actually, that's not good enough. We're not going to allow you. So I think it's really incredible the bu bubbling up from the bottom. And when I look across Europe, I look at just this week in Norway, you know, uh, there have been oil unions and faith organizations and environmentalists coming together against the drilling in the Arctic, but also saying, what does just transition mean? And I think for the environment movement, just transition has got to move, mean more than just lip service. When we're actually talking about people's jobs and livelihoods, what do we mean? And that brings us to political economy. And that's something where a lot of the climate organizations have been very wary about moving into but I think mm. that's where the real fight now is actually it's about what kind of economy are we having what kind of world are we envisaging uh, so it's exciting times but I think it's a real challenge at the moment mm. yeah, it, that's not, Naomi let me I want to I want to throw a question at you um, which is going to keep us on this it's actually going to keep us on the same path um, 
First of all, I want to thank, we're going to start bringing in questions from people who are watching, but I, I neglected off the top, and I'm sorry about this, to thank our sponsor. And I'm not talking about the, one of the world's richest corporations that, you know, lets us use this uh, interface for its own commercial purposes. I am talking about Rabble.ca, who's live streaming this conversation, our cherished, long-standing, fiercely independent media outlet here in Canada. Thank you, Rabble, and for everyone watching on Rabble. Um, I want to bring in this question. Here's a question, Naomi, that's right up your alley and that really speaks to this fulcrum moment that, that, that people are in this conversation are saying that we're in. Duncan Meisel on, on Twitter uh, asked, low oil prices are leading to instability in petrostates. How can we combine the manifesto with a countershock strategy? In, otherwise, in other words, this is a kind of an invitation to articulate this, um, this deeper approach uh, than, than the one that the mainstream climate movement has taken traditionally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I mean that, that's a great example. And I mean, this is, this is um, yeah, I mentioned this earlier about our bad, original bad title of mine, shock, you know, shock to shift, right? Um, and that, that comes from uh, a framing that movement generation, <clears throat> which is a wonderful climate justice uh, uh, group in in the Bay Area uh, came up with where they, they do this presentation called shocks slides and shifts right um, and it's about how uh, shocks like you know very dramatic events but also slides like you know slower motion crises like for instance the drought in California um, can be harnessed to achieve shifts for better and worse I write a, I wrote a book about the worst it's called the shock doctrine about how uh, you know governments and corporations you know can be relied on to systematically use these types of shocks to push through policies undemocratically that they um, wouldn't be able to do otherwise. I mean, the most dramatic example of this is Hurricane Katrina, right? And how that disaster that what was born of a collision between heavy weather of exactly the type that we are seeing more of with climate change because of you know, warmer oceans leads to more powerful storms, colliding with a weak and neglected public sphere creates this catastrophe and then it is harnessed to privatize the school system, eliminate, you know, demolish public housing that are used, uh, you know, overwhelmingly by the African American population in New Orleans, um, you know, forcibly relocate. Um, you know, many of the poorest residents of that city, give them one-way tickets out, um, uh, you know, close down public hospitals and so on. So, uh, you know, if we don't have a counter strategy uh, to harness this shock that we are experiencing, in Canada it's a shock, you know, when the price of oil goes from $150 a barrel to $30 a barrel in a country that has what is now being described as a petrol currency because we invested so heavily in the tar sands, that is a major shock to our economy. If we do not have a strategy for how we use this moment to say, your model has failed, we need another model, and we know what it is, okay? We know what it is and how it can work and how it can create more good jobs than the old model because we have all the research that shows that investments in renewables, efficiency, transit, creates between you know, six and ten times more jobs than the equivalent investments in pipelines, right? Um, then, and also, we also have a plan for how the communities that got the worst deal in the current system, um, who's, who, who had to bear the brunt of the industrial pollution from fossil fuels, should be first in line to own and control their own renewable energy projects. Um, and we also know how to pay for it, right? And this is where we're going to get the money from. We're going to get it through higher royalties. We're going to get it through fi a financial transaction tax. You know, and, 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 you know, we, we, we worked with, and this was uh, something I think was really important in Canada and for people outside Canada who are thinking about doing this, we worked with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, which is a great progressive uh, think tank. Um, and they have a long-running climate justice program and they are respected economists and they costed it out for us. So when we launched the Leap Manifesto, we simultaneously launched a document that they put out called Canada Can Afford to Leap that explains exactly how we can raise the revenue for the big infrastructure investments we were talking about, for the investments in the, in the low carbon 
caring economy, which we, which you know we defined as teaching, um, all the all the caregiving professions, also the arts. You know, Bill, I, I love you know Bill, Bill. Whenever Bill has talked about how people can prepare for climate change, he has this great answer. I don't know, maybe he's changed his answer, but I love this answer about you know the most important thing you can do is build a strong community, take care of each other, because that's going to be most important when the shocks come, right? And so we have to invest in that because that takes infrastructure. Um, you know, that takes uh, so. So, so I, we, if we are going to weather this shock, if the shock is going to be the kind of shift we want, it's going to be some kind of shift, right? And, and so I would say to Duncan um, that, that it's so critical wherever people are, and, and especially in petro states, and I'm afraid Canada is one, we need to have not just our nose, no war, you know, no economic austerity, um, but also what does the alternative look like? What is the post-extractive, justice-based transition. How do we do this? Let me throw Let me in another question, question that's going to still going to keep, keep us in the question, question of how to use the legal frame, frame. Uh, uh, as our counter um, uh, in, in a moment, in a year, that will have shocks. That We know that there are going to be climate shocks. We know that we're in uh, uh, energy shock uh, from the state of the, uh, the, the price of oil, which is both shock and, and opportunity. Um, and we may very well be facing another 2008 in the next year. Uh, we know that nothing was fixed after the last financial crisis. In fact, all of those, all of those uh, corrupt rules are still in place. I inequality continues to spiral. 62 people now control as much wealth as 3.5 billion, half of humanity. Nothing got fixed from 2008. And the, the Wall Street casino uh, proceeds uh, unabated. So we may be facing ourselves facing as a, as, a, as a species another moment of, of global financial convulsion. So I want to throw in a few of the top questions that people have been voting up in this in this Q&A thing because it sort of speaks to, 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 to where we're at and how we're responding. How many are about veganism, just out of curiosity? The number, the, the number one question right now is, can someone speak to the tension between international coalitions and local organizing? Uh, I see you have international panelists, but the leap is about local action. And someone else said, um, hi, Avi, Naomi, Bill, Assad, and everyone. Thanks for putting this on in such an open format. Hey, whatever. Um, happy to. My question, where do you see the value added in the Leap Manifesto? It's great. Actually reminds me of existing platforms from global networks. So I'm interested to know how you hope this can build uh, on the groundwork laid by movements, mostly in the South, rather than build something separately. And Assad, you've already referenced quite, quite rightly that this, all of this work is building uh, on generations of struggle uh, for the people who got the climate crisis and the climate justice uh, frame long before we arrived here in the global north. So this tension between local organizing and local fights and international coalitions and the role that the LEAP can, can play in this. Um, Asa, do you want to try to take a run at that first? Well, I, I don't see any contradiction. In fact, last night I was up in Lancashire and I was on a platform with local campaigners who've been involved in fighting against fracking. For five years they've kept both Lancashire and the UK frack free and it's an incredible fight where the government changes the rules again and again to try and force through fracking. And these were local people who were just run-of-the-mill ordinary people who were suddenly faced with this challenge of fracking on their doorstep and have risen to the challenge and have understood that this is not about just their local issues about water etc but understood both the climate uh, dimension, but also started to talk about the vision of Lancashire and their local like, towns and cities, the kind of jobs that they wanted. And it reminded me that actually 40 years ago, yet this week, factory workers in Lancashire who were making uh, parts for the military uh, were about to lose their jobs and came together and created an alternative plan for their factories. And they created 150 different products. And the top products that they created, and this, remember, is 40 years ago, was wind turbines and low energy and, and, and for low energy homes and kidney machines. And they talked about socially productive goods. So, of course, there's a richness out there in terms of about the low price. So what this is, I think what Leap Manifesto does, what People's Demands do, is speak to where ordinary people are. They want justice. They want jobs. They want to know not just we'd want no to dirty energy, but what kind of alternative energy? Who owns that energy? How are we as a community going to benefit? That for me is what is behind the League Manifesto. It's visioning a society 
and it has all the uh, the framework there that we can build on that connects to our local fights. And here in the UK, we've launched out of Climate Rising a UK People's Demands website where we're crowd surfing, sourcing people's demands, and then we're going to come together and try and look at and create our simple demands that the movements can rally around. I mean, there's a question on there, uh, I think also about climate refugees and, and, and Black Lives Matter. And I think that's, of course, a very pertinent issue here in the UK and across Europe. 244 people have died just in January alone in the Mediterranean. Thousands of people last year. And unless we're connecting our fights and saying, you know, when we talk about owning and creating alternative forms of energy in the UK, if we just talk about our own boundaries, then we're not really talking about our responsibility to the rest of the world. And therefore, what we do outside of our boundaries is as important as what we're doing inside of our boundaries. And therefore, that brings us to the interconnectedness of why we need both the international dimension as well as the local and national dimension. And can I pipe in? Of course. <laughs> um, so one, of, one of the um, critiques of the Elite Manifesto, and I think it's a good one, um, we heard in Paris, um, was that it doesn't have enough about the, responsi uh, can, the responsibility of Canadians um, uh, to act uh, because our extractive companies, our, our, our Canadian mining companies, Canadian oil companies are not just acting in Canada. And indeed, as the extractive economy uh, kind of crashes in Canada, they are even more aggressive in the global south. Um, and so we need to be building those alliances, uh, you know, following that, you know, following that money. Um, what, one point I just want to, want to throw, throw in, um, uh, just you know, has to do with what we have seen recently um, in Flint and Detroit around the connections between emergency managers, right? Um, at, you know, at using an economic crisis, a city goes broke, right? That becomes the pretext to just do away with democracy, appoint an emergency manager who can just do whatever they want. And this is done pretty much exclusively in uh, predominantly African-American cities. Uh, and then we see the, the, the types of environmental impacts of that, right? The environmental racism playing out. And, you know, as I see this, you know, I think what we are seeing is not just this horrific crime in progress, though it is that, it's also a, a huge warning about how the cost of climate change, right? I mean, when you have a Hurricane Sandy, when you have a Hurricane Katrina, I mean, these are multi-billion dollar disasters that put massive strain on the public purse, right? Um, and cities will go, increasingly, I think, if we don't have a counter strategy, this cities will go deeper into economic crisis, and now we're seeing how that will be used. I mean, Assad, I mean, I, I mentioned this, I don't know if I mentioned this in when I Skyped into your conference, but uh, during the British floods in, in, in uh, one of the wealthy areas hit by the flooding, uh, they have brought in private security to protect these homes paid for with, by taxpayers, right? This is what we saw in New Orleans with Blackwater coming in. Um, so if we don't have a strategy for how we respond to climate change that, um, that, that, that is specifically about how we're going to reduce inequality um, and is, is going to be racially just, then left to its own devices, the system is going to deepen inequality. Right, and it is going to create more like deeper fissures. So, um, I, I, I uh, yeah, I think that that's all. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, um, but I, I wanted to ask Bianca too if she could talk about some of the actual local organizing going on, where people are localizing the manifesto. You went to Nunavut, for instance, um, and I know there's a lot of you know there's things happening all over the place. Yeah. yeah so, so um, there are. Uh, is there an echo? <laughs> A little bit. Don't worry. Keep talking. Keep talking. Go. All right. Um, so yeah, there's lots of going on. Uh, there's lots of stuff going on in Canada, and um, one of the things that I find really interesting is that people are sort of taking the manifesto and um, and localizing it because um, you know clean energy economy looks different in every you know community, and um, so one of the uh, one of the places that I was fortunate to visit. Um, uh, was Nunavut in the fall, where um, a group of uh, Inuit women have put together um, the Canuck Manifesto, which um, really speaks more directly to the realities in um, in the north, uh, where um, they're on the you know really on the uh, 
the front lines of climate change. And so we, we actually have a lot to learn from those communities. Also in Halifax, um, Nova Scotia, there are plans for a regional manifesto there. Um, we have places like um, Peterborough, Ontario, where they have um, recently had an event called Localizing the Leap, um, where uh, the community came together to talk about the Leap Manifesto and, um, and to talk about ways that they can commit um, to the different uh, ideas and actions in the Leap Manifesto. So this has been something that's uh, very exciting in terms of um, stuff that's going on. I find people have been very creative in the kinds of projects that they've been taking on and very much doing them from a place um, of personal power, whether it's an art project or um, a com community organizing. One of the things that I feel has been the most powerful is people sort of working and connecting across silos, which is something that really is very reflective of the spirit of the Elite Manifesto. And so that's something that we really want to encourage people to do um, when they are thinking about organizing event is sort of thinking outside of the box, connecting, connecting with groups that you haven't worked with um, in the past and, and just really sort of breaking that down, which I think also speaks to some of the questions that people have been asking about um, solidarity and breaking down um, the sort of barriers. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots, there's definitely been lots going on and, um, and uh, we've actually put a lot of examples as well in our resource guide. Uh, about some of the things that are going so, going on across the country, so I'd highly recommend that people check that out and find out more. It is. It is. Um, it's. You know. I, I feel the appeal of a holistic worldview and a response that speaks to you know a, a whole range of issues and values. But I. I and 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 you know as Assad pointed out earlier, there is a tension within the climate movement world between groups that stay laser focused on climate and between you know, more and more groups who are, who are connecting the dots. Um, and Bill, I want to, um, you know, without sort of doing it in the spirit of putting you on the spot, I would love to know what you think of some of this uh, cross-sectoral, truly cross-issue cross organizing. We've got a bunch of people who are asking questions on Twitter about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and, and trade right. deals. exactly the thing I wanted to talk about. Great. I mean, I Cross-sectoral organizing is uh, is you know exactly what's going on everywhere and needs to be. Um, um, I don't know almost any. I mean, I can't think of almost anyone who's just sort of sits and obsesses only about the climate science anymore. Um, mm -hmm. um, the TPP is a perfect example of this local, global. Uh, you know, you said at the beginning quite happily that you know the Keystone battle was over, but in fact, um, Trans Canada. Corporation a couple of weeks ago announced that they were uh, suing those of us in this country for 15 billion dollars um, because because we rose up democratically, led by indigenous people on both sides of the border, led by farmers and ranchers, led by climate scientists, led by faith groups, the biggest democratic outpouring that there had been around an environmental issue and the. Well, any issue in an age, we managed to beat this thing, and now they want fifteen billion dollars for the, you know their pains. Um, 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 if there was ever a perfect example of why people everywhere are rising up about this next of these stupid trade agreements, the TPP, this was it. I was very happy to see in Auckland yesterday a ton of people in the streets in Auckland, and very happy to see. And this is almost <coughs> Comical beyond belief that that uh, Bernie Sanders has been able to move Hillary Clinton into opposing the Trans-Pacific Partnership because she knows that people are just tired of this she kind of stuff. Say again. She 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 yeah, she was. She wrote it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean she was, but now she's again it because you know when we the, the lesson is when we fight we win, um, and and that's the bottom line. Our problem is we've got so many fights going on, and the good thing about things like the Leap Manifesto is that they help us uh, uh, contextualize all those fights into ways that make them work well together. That doesn't mean we get to avoid any of those specific fights. The way the world works, you still got to, you know, uh, go and try and kick Exxon in the shins as hard as you can and turn around and, you know, work on TPP and uh, whatever it is, but 
it does allow us to have some way to think about how it all, I mean, I'm not a very good systematic thinker, unlike other people on this call, but it really is perhaps particularly useful then for people like me to have written down and, and, and ready to go a uh, sort of constant sense of, of, of how to think about this in the largest context while we're doing what we got to do. But, but, but how, how do you, how do you respond to the very, very common idea, idea that there's, there's only so many people, people who are, are acting at any given time, there's only so many hours in a day, day. There's too many issues to take on, and the TPP is just beyond what we can take on right now. We've got, you know. It doesn't seem like that to me. I mean, the interesting thing about the way that it's sort of the, the climate justice stuff seems to be working out is maybe, maybe, maybe because the fossil fuel industry is such a sprawled out uh, uh, protein uh, creature that uh, sort of naturally there's sprung up this resistance everywhere in Lancashire and in, uh, you know, uh, uh, Alberta and in Nigeria and in the Philippines and everybody's fighting hard on things they've got to fight on, but we're getting pretty good about coming together too when there are places where we can make ourselves heard uh, uh, en masse. And that's, that's good. That's, you know, that's one of the things that goes well with the uh, you know, living in an age when we are more connected and networked, and that's one of the places where we have a huge advantage over lumbering, immobilized, but hugely wealthy uh, corporations who aren't very good at that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, kicking them from every possible side at all times is, strikes me as a good idea. There's a, there's a question that's coming up in the, in, in the chat that I want to shift to, which is a big one. Naomi, jump in. Oh yeah, I just, I, I just, because I, I know we're sort of coming to a close, that I just wanted to, um, to, to just come back to this point around the fact that we're in no way claiming um, that we invented uh, something here. Uh, you know, what the spirit in which we offer this is that we think, um, we think it's a great metaphor, <laughs> um, and uh, we think deadlines are helpful, right? Um, and so, you know, the fact that this is a leap year, the fact that leap day is coming up at the end of the year, it's just like an excuse, right? Uh, it kicks our butt a little bit. Um, and, uh, and, and then the other thing is, you know, these leap years things, they only happen every four years, right? And, um, you know, we started this call talking about the fact that we are in de what's been called decade zero of the climate crisis. We need uh, to get our act together in a really serious way and have emissions pointing in the right direction by the end of this decade. So by the time we have another leap year, you know, we've got another, a pretty serious deadline on our hands. Um, we need to be mid-flight uh, when that happens. Um, but, you know, this project is inspired by the, you know, the kind of amazing work going on with Our Power, uh, the campaign in the U.S., um, you know, these concrete uh, um, projects of, you know, getting, uh, you know, solar cooperatives going in the, in the shadow of the Chevron refinery in Richmond, California, or the Black Mesa Water Coalition. When we launched the LEAP uh, in Canada, we showed a video from our friend Melina Labucan Massimo, um, uh, who is on the board of 350, and she also works at Greenpeace. Um, she's Lubicon Cree, and in her community of Little Buffalo, they launched this incredible solar project. They're in the heart of the Alberta tar sands. Their community was um, uh, was the site of one of the most uh, devastating uh, pipeline disasters in Canada. And uh, just a few months ago, uh, thanks to you know this amazing hard work in this community, they launched this very large solar project. All we're saying is. This should be policy. That this can't be one-offs. Um, you know, we are seeing incredible examples of communities showing it's possible. But what we what we think is that it's the role of government at every level to say, of course, frontline communities should be first in line to own and control their own renewable energy projects. The money is there. Here's how we raise it. Um, and uh, and the other thing is that you know I think there's no shortage of um, kind of coalition documents that are essentially laundry lists, like here's all the things that we are against, here's all the things we are in favor of. What we try to do is tell it more like a story, right? How all of these issues are interconnected through this common lens of shifting from an extractive economy to an economy based on caring for one another and caring for the earth. Uh, and that is what came out of this kind of extraordinary gathering. Um, and that, you know, I, as we say at the beginning of the document, this is about learning from the original caretakers of the land, um, uh, and uh, and and so um, you know, I, I just 
I don't know if we're going to keep going, but I just want to make sure I have a chance to um, say a huge thank you uh, to Assad and Bill for uh, making time today uh, to participate in this. And Assad, I hope everything is okay. Um, and Bill, I know you had to completely rearrange your schedule to make this happen. Um, so I'm just so grateful to everybody on this call and and um, and Katie and Bianca for the incredible work that you're doing uh, to get us leaping. Um, I just want to offer one more thing. I thought I'd milked the leap metaphor for everything it was worth. Um, but then Katie pointed out uh, a couple days ago, uh, and I put this in my piece that came out in The Guardian yesterday, that the thing about a leap is if it's going to work, you need a lot of momentum leading up to it. And we've got that. We've got that. If there's one thing we've got, it's momentum, you know. Um, I feel really good about that. Uh, and I'm so grateful uh, um, to Bill and Assad for all the incredible work you guys have done to, to put a spring in our steps. <laughs> She's got a way of wrapping it up. Asad, anything you want to throw in there? As we, and everybody as we out there listening. Well, I, I just wanted to say, come back about the Leap Manifesto and say, you know, I think it is a very, very important document because you're absolutely right. We are, uh, what I find incredible is that we are doing this, you know, all over the place. But actually having a manifesto, having a framework, having a lens that reflects that back and amplifies that suddenly connects what you're doing to other people, both at a national and a global level, and of course that builds power, and that makes the dreaming and the visioning of what is achievable much more realistic, so suddenly we're able to say, actually, this is a pie in the sky, because look, people in Canada are doing it, Naomi's doing it, oh great, we can do it. So I think it's both inspiring to have that document, but also I think it, it is an important tool for the movement, because they can look and just having on the website and having all these other documents to recognize that actually people have done this amazing work and we can build from it and we're building and we always say we stand on the shoulders of people who came before us and of course as a movement I don't think we should be re you know re reject, reject that of course we build on everything and so it's great to have the Leap Manifesto it's really inspired us here in the UK and we're taking it out not just in the UK but right across Friends of the Earth groups and trying to connect all of that and hopefully be much, much stronger and really make 2016 a year for climate justice. Beautiful. You, know, you got a class to give or something, or some undergrads to subvert, don't you? Absolutely, but I just wanted They're to... They're learning at your door now. People are, bang, are going to ba start banging it down. This <laughs> Go is, ahead. This is, this is really good, and it's really good to see everybody. Uh, I'm glad we're through Paris. I always thought it was, you know, like something to get through so we could get back to the real work of causing mm -hmm. trouble. And um, I'm very glad that uh, everybody is uh, busy causing trouble. So see you all soon. And Ruby, uh, Naomi, Vi, everybody, Katie, thank you guys for organizing all this. Bye, Bill. Uh, Katie, just as we say goodbye to everyone, Katie, um, there's there's a, often at the end of these conversations a desire on the on the on the part of the audience for a kind of concrete. What can I do? Give me a place to plug in. Give me some links. Do you want to do a quick run through for if people watching uh, want to follow up? Uh, some some options. Yeah, so if somebody's listening here and thinking, okay, this has been a great conversation, but what should I do next? This is why we launched leapyear2016.org. So if you go check out the website, that you'll see that there's events happening around the world. You know, some of the stuff that we talked about today, Break Free from Fossil Fuels is going to be happening in over a dozen countries with big civil disobedience, but all actions at fossil fuel sites, but also uh, stepping up and supporting alternatives. Assad is working on the people's demands uh, work that's happening in the UK. There's chances for people to participate now. Uh, that's uh, the people's demands is that, that website. Beyond Coal and Gas is going to be launching in Australia. The Next Systems Project is hosting teach-ins across the US. And if you go to the site, you'll see there's a lot of local events that are happening where people are either hosting a screening, having a local discussion. There's lots of opportunities for people to come out. And if you don't see something that you like, then you have the chance to host your own event. And there's a there's a step-by-step -step guide on how you can do it there, too. I guess the, the last thing I just want to say is if you are running a campaign or hosting an event that you think is part of the, the leap and thinking about the kind of the next economy, climate justice, the work that we're all in together, and you want it hosted on the site, you can add it through the website. So just go to leapyear2016.org and you can add your events there or send us an email at um, contact at leapmanifesto.org and we'll get back to you there as well. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Sorry for the questions we didn't get to, but thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Abby.
Ah, que legal. 